have no idea where our food comes from or what's in it. Too much sugar, too much salt. And right now we have a culture of giant portions. Waste is a major concern. Literally, it's insane. I mean, think about an oil company that pumps out the oil out of the ground and then throws away a third of it. It was so important to have locally sourced food is because that is what we saw during COVID. The communities gathered one little fist of food and whatever they had and they shared it. It was the communities who were in charge and therefore equality and ensuring that each community can become sustainable is extremely important. All the talks about sustainability of food system, equal distribution, it all stems from being a responsible person eating healthy and ensuring that you have respect from the pastures to your folk. But the problem with the food system today is that it doesn't reward farmers and people like myself in the right balance for what we give as an effort in producing food. If we can um, make sure that, that, that the average citizen is more aware of, of what kind of efforts go into food production, that by definition they will also have a better understanding of, of what the actual value, not only the economic value, but the absolute value uh, of food is, and therefore treat it in a different way than, than we sometimes do. We are focused on seeing how we can eradicate hunger. There are a lot of economic um, prospects for the cassava. Cassava can be used for staple food, it has industrial uses. And also we see that the Nigeria has comparative advantage over it as a crop. In Mexico, one of the biggest problems is the pricing in food because eating cheap, it's unhealthy and eating uh, healthy, it's expensive. There's a lot of diabetes in, in Mexico. The levels of obesity, it's unthinkable. The first and the best place to start is with education. Farming. There are about 1.2 billion young Farming. people in the world and 80% of those live in Farming. rural areas. There are EFED funded projects where Farming. they can go and get the right training Farming. and the right knowledge. Farming. I just created a very simple dance. We put it on TikTok and to our surprise, it became a viral sensation. It's not just a dance, but it's a petition to get young people around the world to understand the importance that farming has for our future feeding. Aquaponics is a really elegant solution because it mimics nature in the way it sustainably produces food. It grows produce that is of extremely high quality, extremely fast, and in very small surfaces. You can grow in a city, you can grow on a rooftop, you can grow on infertile land because you essentially don't need any soil for it. We found that nitrogen concentration in many states in India is eight times higher than the ideal amount. Overfertilization creates a negative return for over 10 million farmers. So my vision is to create a complete smart solution that addresses everything from fertilizer determination to identification of crop diseases using just a simple handheld device. Fundamentally, we have to change our core values, focus on sustainability uh, of how we produce our food and the well-being of those who consume it to make sure that that's available for everybody. We have to start investing in the next generation when it comes to how we're producing our food. Change incentives to think much more long-term than we do today. Guard our natural resources to make sure that our food system is not increasing the calamity of climate change while also preparing itself to adapt to all the volatility that awaits us. No one should be left out, from the farmers to the policy makers to those in the public and private sector. Everyone needs to be brought to the table. Create a system that is profitable for the 130 million farmers in India. People will take risks and do new things and grow only when you have a stable platform. We got to get going. The time for talk is over. We're running out of time. In fact, quite frankly, we've run out of time. And we gotta just start getting some things done.
Wow, welcome everyone. Um, thank you for joining us today. And what a great film and way to start this event. So thank you to everyone who took part. I personally am delighted to be here with you today. My name is Sabrina and I'll be your host today. I'm not sure if um, many of you know this, but I actually come from a pastoral family. My mother grew up in a small farming community in rural Somalia, and I learned from her how difficult life can be when you depend on the land to grow your own food and survive. That has never been obviously more true than today. And as you all know, we're in the midst of a global food and climate crisis with the pandemic still raging. By Christmas, up to 12,000 people a day could die from hunger. More than will die and are dying each day from the current pandemic. And in addition, the world is not on track to meet international targets for stunting obesity, diabetes, and wasting. 30% of the food that is produced in the world today goes to waste. 30% of greenhouse gas emissions come from the way it is produced. And one third of our land is degraded. That's obviously an immense threat to productivity. But this is also a hopeful time. Around the world, people are rising up, they are stepping up, they are demanding to be heard, to address climate change, to provide justice, to ensure equality, and to ensure health and wellness for all. That has never been more important than now. I became a Goodwill Ambassador for the United Nations International Fund for Agricultural Development, not because agriculture is particularly a trendy topic, although that is changing, but because food has the power to change real people's lives across Africa and developing nations, but also across Europe and North America. We all need food to survive. But behind the food we eat are the faces and silent voices of the farmers who grow it. These are the mothers, the fathers, the children who wake up early when the sun rises. They do the hard work and plant the seeds needed to feed the world, but they desperately need greater investment in order to help local communities and our world build resilient and healthy food systems. I really believe that they are the solution. People care about these issues and millions of global citizens have made their voices clear. They want our governments, our leaders and private sector companies to shift the food system and get it working for all of us. We have to invest and empower vulnerable people along the way and find new ways to feed a growing world sustainably. This is why I'm thrilled to be here with you today and to discuss how to use food systems as a force for good in the world. We all know that these are things that can be done and undone, but we must take action now. That is why today is so important. Ahead of next year's UN Food Systems Summit and the next climate summit, we really don't have a moment to lose and we can all play a role. So I am absolutely delighted to now introduce Agnes Kalabata, the UN Special Envoy for the United Nations Food Systems Summit. She's a trailblazing woman and leader who really needs no introduction. President of AGRA, the Alliance for Green Revolution in Africa. She's also served as Rwanda's Minister of Agriculture and Animal Resources. Agnes, over to you, the floor is yours. Thank you, Sabrina. Thank you for those uh, introductory remarks, but also for the introduction. It's, uh, it's a challenge coming after you, but I'm going to try and do justice to the tone you've set here. <laughs> Good. Uh, so I'm really happy to be joining you all at this uh, multi partner event uh, at Wagengen. And I appreciate all the organization that has gone into making this happen, this event happen, uh, from IFAD, from Wagengen University, from private sector, and from the government of the Netherlands. Really kudos to be getting us here together today to discuss a very interesting topic. As you might know, last year, um, the Secretary General launched the Food System Summit, uh, the 2021 Food System Summit, with only one goal in mind, to unleash the power of food systems to drive progress against all 17 uh, SDGs. And, you know, we have a lot to think about when it comes to food. Food is everything to us. Food is, uh, is yes, it's what nourishes us, but it's also what brings us together. It's what brings us together as families, as communities, and as nations. Our food is underpinned by our culture, by our economies, and by uh, uh, everything that we care about, especially our environment. But this is, what we are talk, going to talk about here today is not about the importance of food. No, food is important, but what is important here today is that we discuss how our food has the opportunity to help us change everything, change how we, we deal with the question of hunger, 
but also change how humanity deals with the question of health for people and planet. And I'll repeat this. It's extremely important that we discuss the challenges ahead of us, the power of food and food systems to change hunger, to change health and to change the health of our planet and, 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 and the health of people. So how are we thinking about it from a food systems perspective? From a food systems perspective, we've come up with a number of ways of looking at how uh, we might get this whole thing moving. But there are challenges, and we are going to build on what you've talked about here. And I just wanted to tell you, to, to respond to one of the questions that I get that people ask me all the time and around what gives you hope, what makes you think that this is going to be successful. And I keep telling them that I've seen some of the most difficult situations turn into some of the best successes of the world because humanity has the ability to do that. And I tell them the Rwandan story where people look at Rwanda today and they say, oh, there's a world miracle there. But Rwanda is not a miracle. It's the hard work of lots of people that have only one thing in common, a future that they don't want to look their, like their past. So here in our food systems, we already see something. We already see that we have a lot of things that are broken and we need to agree that we need to fix what's happening in our food system. COVID-19 has highlighted a lot, a lot for us, a lot of what needs to be done. And we have an opportunity to come together and do the right thing for our people and for our planet. But we have a number of issues going on in our landscape and in our environment. We have trust issues. Let's be honest. Let's talk about some of the things we don't talk about when we come together. A lot of us don't trust private sector. You know, a lot of us think private sector is not working for a lot of uh, countries. It's not working for a lot of people. It's not working for so many things. And if I just give an example, if you look at some of the reports, for example, a report that came out last, uh, I think it was the year before last, talking about consumer goods, the consumer goods, um, the companies that are in the consumer goods forum, that only 32% produce safe food. Uh, I'm saying I'm reporting. Or well, when you look at the study uh, from the World Economic Forum, um, uh, SDG challenge, uh, there, there was a study around how private sector uh, is, taking, uh, is, is behaving towards SDGs, uh, which suggests that only 79% of companies report against their emissions. These are some of the things that underpin that lack of trust. But is it enough for us not to engage private sector? Is it enough for us not to have a conversation? Because you see, for me, where some of these challenges exist, I also prefer to see possibilities. Let us look at what governments can do to change some of the subsidies they are having into how we might drive for better, uh, for better outcomes among some of the things we care about. Let's look at how individually we put so much demand on our environment. Our demands for what we eat are, is, is definitely going to be translated on demands into our environment. So we do have a responsibility there too. But I also want to reach out to our civil society colleagues. Not engaging is not a solution. Not engaging is not an option given where we are at today. So we do all have a responsibility to engage and make sure that we go forward. We have a number of things that are stake. And I want to highlight these as goals of the summit. Number one, one hungry person today, amidst the plenty that we have, amidst the knowledge that we have, is one too many. So we should not be having hungry people. Number two, we need to be modest on our demands on our environment. We are, our consumer demands are such that we, we definitely, as I said earlier, are wasting a lot of food, but also are not commensurate with what the environment can do for us. Number three, we are contributing to climate change, whether we like it or not. And the only reason I'm in this summit conversations with you all is because my communities here in Africa, we suffer from climate change every day. Maybe many people around the world haven't seen it, but we do live it every day. And for me, I'm determined to see this change. Number four, livelihoods and equity, equity of livelihoods. 
look at just how many people were thrown off board by COVID. Just how many people. I mean, it is heartbreaking to see in some of these developed countries, let me just be honest with you, lines and lines of people looking for food, waiting, people who had jobs yesterday. So what, there must be something we, must, we can do around the deep things. Number five and last, our world is now living through all these challenges and it's being challenged every day. We must build resilience of people and planet. So there's no question around it. We must build resilience. So these are the anchors of our, what we are calling action tracks. And what I would like to, to encourage you to do is to engage all the action tracks, ensure that as private sector, you're bringing your best because you already have a lot of stuff that is going on and we want to build on that. That you're bringing the best, you're putting your best foot forward, but you're also challenging the action tracks you're making sure that what is there is good enough for the type of ambition we need to have for this time in our world. We have to have a very high level of ambition. We can't just do stuff that makes us feel comfortable. We need to ensure that there are businesses for our children tomorrow. We need to ensure that there's a world for us tomorrow. So our level of ambition is going to be very, 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 very important. So do challenge the action trucks, do engage, ensure that our ambitions are bigger and better for the future of the planet we are engaging with. Next, we, need, we are designing this as a, 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 a people's summit. In designing it as a people's summit, we have a number of dialogues that are going on at country level. We want you to participate in these dialogues. And if there's none in your country, please ensure that you, you, are, you are advocating for one. And if still there's none, or you want to engage differently, go to the independent dialogues uh, platform, which is available on, on, on online. Do engage and make sure that your voice is being heard and make sure that the voices of your networks are being heard. So make sure that we are reaching out to so many people. Last year, I mean this year, last month, we, learn, we ran, um, on World Food Day, we ran a really trying to reach so many people launching the food systems dialogue. When we did that, we were able to reach 2.5 million people in one day, in 24 hours. My hope is that by the time we are done in the next 10 months, we have reached 5 billion people. Because at the end of the day, this food system, this idea of food, this problem we are trying to solve is a very individual problem. Each of us makes a decision to eat three times a day, and we must give each of us a chance and a choice to decide the future of our food system, knowing fully well that we are challenging our food system. The good news is with this summit, there's an agreement that we must do something. With this summit, we are recognizing what is broken. And with this summit, we have an opportunity to come up with major global ambitions that can take huge, that can scale uh, the right way. So this is an opportunity of a lifetime. We must use the opportunity the summit is giving us to bring the best ideas forward. To, 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 you know, to go through the challenges we know we, we need to sort through, to, to go through the discussions we need to go through, but agree on the future of our, of our planet. So I want to end um, this, uh, uh, this uh, keynote with a call to you all. I would like to engage, like I said. I would like you to ensure that other people are engaging. And I would like to us to make sure that we come to this summit with our, our best ambition. We come to this summit ready to challenge each other. And at the end of the day, we need to make sure that our world is changing because our food system is ready for a transition. And we need to be part of ensuring that that transition happens. So I look forward to being part of the conversations that are happening in the next two days. And I look forward uh, to being part of advocating for the changes you, you will help put forward. And I look part of ensuring that we actually have one conversation and that we listen to each other and that we build trust among each other. So I wish you a good meeting and thank you so much for inviting me. Over to you, uh, Sabrina. Agnes, thank you so much. Um, that was perfectly said. Now with less than a year to go until the UN Food System Summit and uh, the need for a systemic transformation of our food systems, I think we can all see the road ahead. So I'm delighted to introduce uh, the panel moderator for our next session, Pathways for Change. Karen So may look familiar to some of you as she is CNBC's anchor for Squawk Box Europe. Karen, please take it away. Let me extend a warm welcome from the CNBC studios 
here in London, we've spent most of this year on the network talking about the economic challenge of COVID-19. And part of our DNA is explaining the story behind numbers. The World Bank was uh, issuing a report suggesting 690 million people were already the chronically food insecure before this crisis. We know supply chains have been disrupted, impacting the delivery of food. Many countries have a twin crises to contend with. Uh, the environmental impacts on top of COVID-19 this year, the price fluctuations that we've witnessed in commodity prices, also currency depreciation driving up the cost of those food imports. So the situation is urgent today. It will be even more urgent tomorrow. I want to pick up on what Agnes has called the 2021 UN Food Systems Summit to engage with a wide range of stakeholders. Today with us, we do have a wide ranging group of speakers from Europe to Africa to ASEAN. They represent farmers, business, government, youth, chefs, showing the diversity of who is involved and what is required. We're going to use this platform to talk about opportunities, priorities and bold actions required to support this ambitious agenda for the Food Systems Summit. So let's uh, introduce you to the speakers we have today. Dominic Wore is Managing Director of the World Economic Forum. Dominic has responsibility for WEF's climate change and water security programs. Also joining us today, Esther Penunia, who is the Secretary General of Asian Farmers Association for Sustainable Rural Development. So Esther works with a regional alliance of farmers in Asia, which means many small farmers on the front line of food production. Alan Joe, the CEO of Unilever. Unilever, as many of you know, is the home to some of the biggest household brands in the world, also has a huge footprint in emerging markets, which is key as we talk about food security. Massimo Batura, chef and food systems activist. I'm going to call him a national treasure in Italy. He's one of the top chefs in the world. And recently, the UN Environment Programme recently appointed him as the newest goodwill ambassador to help fight food waste. Kate Robertson, who is founder One Young World. Kate is, uh, was the chairman of the advertising giant Havas Group, working with some of the biggest brands in the world, and now brings together some of the brightest young talent in the world, giving them a voice through her platform. Also on the line today, Sunny Fagesi, who is the co-founder and group CEO of Olam International. Sunny is an influential voice in the sector for many years as the head of an agri-giant, also the chair of the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, and joining us by video today will be Geraldine Matchett, who is the co-chief executive officer and chief financial officer of Royal DSM. And many of you, as you know, Agnes Calabata is on the line, who you just heard from in that introduction. I'm going to ask for some opening comments from all of our speakers today. And we'll ask you to keep it brief so we can kick it around the group. First up, I'm going to toss it over to Dominic. And Dominic, you've spoken on this being the decade of delivery for the SDGs and the Paris Targets. What will it take for food to be central to this delivery? Thank you, Karen, so much. It's a pleasure to be with you and a delight to uh, uh, engage in the conversation. So as we heard from Agnes, who put it beautifully, it's absolutely clear that to deliver on the sustainable development goals and the Paris targets, a systems approach is needed. Food sits at the intersection of all agendas with food and agriculture touching on all 17 of those sustainable development goals. So we must look at solutions that bring about co-benefits, for instance, nutrition and nature, dietary diversification and reduction of deforestation, innovation and job creation, and so on. We must also look to problem solve by bringing in many diverse stakeholders to co-construct those solutions, especially those who are often left out the farming communities, consumers, the small and medium enterprises, entrepreneurs and technology pioneers, and youth together with public, private and civil society actors. There's tremendous knowledge and networks and motivation to co-develop these solutions. And there's also this sense of urgency that needs to be shared to unlock these problems. So the opportunities are there. Now, if food systems are transformed, the economic impact has been valued at an enormous $10.5 trillion a year in value by 2050. That's from the Food and Land Use Commission. But, good, and land, but uh, good land use systems generate hidden environmental health and poverty uh, costs and benefits too. These costs can be estimated at almost $12 trillion a year. So there's a two to $3 trillion a year socioeconomic deficit 
in our current state. This means that productive and regenerative food systems that are good for people, good for the planet, and good for the prosperity, if we get this right, can actually create up to $3 trillion in business opportunities and over 175 million jobs by 2030. So we deal with those problems, we find those co-creative solutions, and there are real upsides in the economy and jobs. But reaching these opportunities requires those new models of collaboration. And that's why today's event, for instance, which reflects an incredible collaboration across 13 organizations from government, civil society, business, and others to come together to support the United Nations Food Systems Summit is so important. No sector, no stakeholder, and no entity can deliver the food systems transformation of tomorrow alone. It's so clear that we must increasingly reach across the aisle to bring in young leaders, diverse perspectives, new technologies, whilst also asking the really quite tough questions of each other to ensure that no one is left behind and that we meet our health and environmental goals and a transformed food system together. That's why it has to be a decade of delivery, and that's why it has to be a decade of collaborative delivery. In the world of the farmer, we have nine harvests remaining until 2030 to get this right. And to put into perspective the urgency to not only focus on the what, but as was said already, to shift to the how, and how we can do that together. So the Food System Summit next year is a great moment to build towards, to accelerate action towards the Sustainable Development Goals, that decade of delivery. And to conclude, I'd say it's no longer about my thing being the thing, uh, your project, that project, this project. Rather, it is about creating platforms to work together to deliver at scale in a way that is healthier for both the planet and for people. Thank you so much, Karen. Dominic, thank you very much for those remarks. I'm now going to toss it over to Esther. As head of the Asian Farmers Association and wearing your hat as a member of the advisory committee of the UN Food Systems Summit, what must happen to ensure the Food Systems Summit is a people's summit this time and to ensure inclusivity for farmers as key stewards of the food system? Yeah. Thank you for your question, Karen, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening here in Manila. We like the word People Summit because it connotes inclusiveness. So the most neglected, the most marginalized can come to the meeting and be active participant in the discussions. We like the ambition that this is a solution summit because that means for us that we do not just talk about our challenges, but rather provide solutions to the problems at hand. But what needs to be different are two things, we think. One is how do we involve in this summit the family farmers all over the world, especially the small-scale family farmers who compose 70% of all family farmers and who produces 80% of the world's food. They are the landless farmers, agriculture workers, artisanal or small-scale fishers, pastoralists and herders, and many of them belonging to indigenous people's communities living in rural areas, sometimes hard, far-flung areas. We need to be involved in this summit as active participants. So we need our voices and our experiences to be heard and listened to in the key processes of the summit and our recommendations to have a big weight in the discussions and be considered. So second, what we do with the solutions that will be identified in this summit, we hope this is just not talk. But at the end of the summit, there will be clear investments, clear partnerships, multi-stakeholder processes in terms of research and innovations, capacity building, and financing or investments to carry out the solutions that have been identified. We hope that this People's Summit will be the end of major summits, and the next time it will be monitoring, sharing experiences on how we have implemented the solutions that we have identified in the multi-stakeholder process of the Food Systems Summit. Thank you. Esther, thank you very much. I'm not going to switch over to Alan, because Alan, the Food Systems Summit will be different because of its focus on solutions. I want you to weigh on how effectively to focus on these outcomes, given this is exactly what corporates do. They set targets and then try and come up with solutions to hit those targets for shareholders. 
Uh, thanks, Karen. Let me uh, just give two short messages. You've got a lot of wonderful panelists, so I'll try and keep it very brief. Uh, the first message is we have a unique moment, an opportunity to create a collective and ambitious vision for our food systems. We should be asking ourselves, what is the food equivalent of the one and a half degree and a, a milestone and goal on climate change? How can this summit be the COP21 for food? The second message is we really need to bring stakeholders together from across the food system to solve this problem. Too much decision making is made centrally by the global north. Um, I couldn't agree more. We need farmers, smallholders, workers, young people, entrepreneurs, academics uh, around the table. And one important stakeholder uh, is the private sector. The private sector helped with the ambition of the Paris Agreement and we're prepared to do our part on food systems. So there you go, we need a big goal and a collective effort. Alan, thank you very much. Uh, Massimo, now to you. Because of the COVID pandemic, restaurants around the world have faced significant disruptions this year. How can we accelerate resilience, ensuring that restaurants can come back stronger and operate more sustainably in the future? Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, it's great to be here sharing uh, ideas with you guys. You know, I'm, a, I'm an Italian chef and founder of a no-profit uh, Food for Soul. Um, for 35 years, I've been part of this uh, food economy. But uh, food uh, is not just uh, economy. Food is culture. Food is health. Uh, and most important, uh, food is community. Uh, it plays a huge role in all of our lives, not just chef farmers and uh, movers and shakers in the food industry, but everyone. Probably if I'm here as a chef, maybe the food summit is already changing, you know. Uh, my restaurant uh, has always aimed uh, to provoke uh, our guests to see and taste things from another point of view, take the issue of food waste um, and we do not waste anything in our kitchens. If you can see the invisible potential behind the stale bread, bruised fruit, vegetable peels, and crust of Parmigiano-Reggiano cheese, then you will be able to expand your creativity and use these ingredients instead of throwing them away. Uh, not waste, uh, not wasting is a demonstration of primate responsibility. Changing behavior is one step to finding solution to how we grow our food, how we shop for our food, how we use ingredients in our kitchen. People make change happen. Revolution starts in the field and out in the street. Uh, to make this, uh, this food summit, um, you know, a people summit and a solution summit, there need to be synergy between uh, the many voices in the food community. We need to listen to each one. You know, a food summit is not just a discussion about who is hungry, but also about obesity, about overconsumption, health, and uh, Weeping is not just about how to grow our food better, but also how to waste less, how to get the best and the most out of the investment in the food system. Food waste is one of uh, the major causes uh, of climate change. We use water, energy, and uh, the product and to produce food, but also what we do, we throw it away, it's crazy. We produce food for 12 billion people. We are 7 billion on Earth. We, there are 860 million people. They don't have anything to eat. And we waste 1.3 billion tons of food every, every, every year. You know? And, uh, you know, what today we are in a time in which people, they are listening, looking for solutions that have a collective impact that benefit everyone. Climate change, caring for environment, investing in nature, 
It's the civic responsibility of all. It's a call to act. Massimo, thank you very much for that. You've already challenged me how to think about my chopping board next time when I'm uh, chopping up vegetables in the kitchen. Thank you. Kate, let me toss it over to you. The Secretary General has called for the UN Food Systems Summit to be a people's summit, and you have written, there is genuine hope to be found in our young people. How do you see young people taking the lead to end world hunger and save our planet? So again, here, yeah, thank you, Karen, um, to, to, to not use too, too much of everybody's time. Um, I, just to say this, representing these young leaders here. So at One Young World, we are working with young leaders at, in different positions in the food chain all over the world. As Sabrina said in her opening remark, agriculture is becoming more interesting and slightly sexier for this young group. It needs to be the sexiest thing on the planet, okay? But let me just tell you a couple of the, the challenges that are facing that we need to address at scale and with speed. So to Al's point about make this the COP21 of the food system, let's get on with it. Okay, so just two things. Um, Agnes's point about trust issues. And I take the point about wariness around the private sector, but I always say when things need funding, let's go where the fish are swimming. Okay, so one of the issues these young farmers and young people in the system bring to the table is that the first stage of funding that they need for their initiatives, and I will tell you now, if you want 200 of the best agri tech and agribusiness young initiatives in the world already at proof of concept, call me, we have them. They have a problem with pre-seed finance because even if it's small, they are asked to provide collateral they cannot provide. There is an opportunity here for private sector and for all of the grant money that is sloshing around. The youngsters tell me there's a lot of it, interesting and things like government declarations in the Malobo Declaration, which is 10% of government revenue, supposed to be going into agriculture. There is no reason we can't pull together these funds to give instant collateral for these youngsters. Yes, some money will be lost, but not all. So at the World Economic Forum at the beginning of this year, before pandemic was so massive in all our lives, I did hear this plea for funding from a lot of the youngsters who were attending in Davos. And I said, okay, we'll get, you, we'll get money for you and we'll get it quickly. So we did $50,000 prize immediately, um, which went to a young farmer in Mexico who takes corn cobs from the corn farmers. They are making a sugar alternative, a healthy sugar alternative, and they've been able to scale up that business very quickly. So those of us in private sector or who've been in the private sector may think $50,000 is not a lot. For these youngsters, it's a lot. So this early, if you like, not the last mile of funding, but the first mile. What are we going to do about it? What are we going to do at scale? Okay. And how do we get this moving so that agri-tech becomes like tech and moves just as fast? And just the last point, um, this is an elephant in the corn patch. Okay. This is something that is going to have to be addressed. Um, I think Esther mentioned landless farmers. Yeah. So, it is not sexy for young people to go into farming when they will be not even tenant farmers. They are just cheap labor. So you can have all these government programs that teach people about good agriculture and sustainability and all the rest of it. You know what? If I'm 22, I don't want to do that. I'm going to go to the city and I'm going to go and work for Google or somebody because I'm going to get more cash by the hour and I'm going to earn my wages and I won't have poured my heart and soul into land that someone else owns and is exploiting me. So this question, which, as I say, is the elephant in the corn patch, will somewhere, somehow have to be addressed. That is to be addressed at government level, absolutely right. no question. But I have to look at the stealing of land that goes on by government agents all over the world. Do you know right. what? If you can steal someone's land and farm, you can damn well make a plan to give it back. These are the two issues that okay. young people 
who want to find agri-tech sexy are facing. That's me, out. Okay, thank you very much for that. Uh, Sunny, let me bring you in. Now, uh, we're running a little bit over, so I might uh, get some brief comments from you. You are leading a global business. You've called for mandatory reporting to go beyond financial earnings. Why is this important and necessary to ensure resilient food systems? Because as managers and business leaders, we manage what we can measure. So in order to be able to measure all of the other capitals uh, that today are difficult to measure in terms of the benefits that we derive from the ecosystem to produce the food, feed, and fiber that we all depend on, because Mother Nature's back office is not set up and issuing us those invoices, we do not true cost the cost of really producing food. So I think uh, ensuring that we have multiple capitals reporting and find a way of reporting nature and find a way of reporting uh, social capital, because these are the big problems that we are all gathered here to solve whether it is this group of people here today or other like-minded coalitions, inspired coalitions around the world. We're all trying to solve for this problem of how do we produce enough food, feed and fiber to feed a growing population without destroying the planet, being right or doing right by the producers and the farmers. Today, the 500 million smallholder farmers who produce 70% of our food, 60% of them are below the $1.90 poverty line and 90% of the smallholder farmers are at the poverty line. And the poverty line definition is only one third of the living income uh, that these households need. So even if they meet the poverty line, they're about a third of what is the minimum living income that they need. So how do we address for this issues? Given that this is a solution summit, I think the first thing for us is to improve farmer livelihoods and therefore improve the communities where these farmers are in terms of enhancing their prosperity. And we need to have a technology enabled solutions that can provide them on, in a consumable, very personalized way, machine learning enabled agronomy nudge brain that can provide them crop care advice at a very atomic level in terms of what is the next best action that they need to take on their farm to change their circumstances. We need to make sure that our supply chains are climate and nature positive, which means how do we get to be deforestation free in the various food and agricultural raw materials that we produce, which means we should have a way of being able to establish which are the sensitive hotspots around the world, around national parks, around forest reserves, where the farmers have an incentive to encroach and plant because they have a terrible living income and they right. can't make ends meet and therefore they need to do that. So we need to address this. And I think we need granular solutions enabled by technology to have a fundamentally transformative way in which we can address these problems. Otherwise we will be talking in mega meta generic terms. And I don't think we will achieve much. Having the UN SDGs or the climate accord or the biodiversity convention targets is only 10, 15% of the ball game. The last biodiversity targets that we had, we had 20 goals to be achieved by 2020, we have achieved four. 85% of the ball game is the action gap. What do we do granularly to change these issues? And if as a collective, this one, or the other inspired collectives around the world, we can really find those granular pathways, we would have done everybody a big favor. Sunny, thank you for those terrific messages. I'm now going to toss to a video that has been sent to us from Geraldine Machette, who is the CEO, co-CEO of Royal DSM. The food crisis is not only about people suffering from hunger, it's actually about all of us. When we think about it, our relationship with food underpins the rise of most human civilizations. Yet the food production system has often been the source of the collapse of those civilizations. When we think about climate change, the biggest risk is probably not the gradual rising of sea levels. It is the fact that what will hit us first is a rapid collapse of the food production system across the globe, leading to increased poverty and political unrest. And the irony is that the food system is actually the second biggest contributor to greenhouse gases and therefore a major cause of the climate change itself. And I have to say that this will not happen only in a few places in the world. This will impact us in all countries because weather patterns are changing everywhere. Now we can take action, but it will require radical transformation. And three key things 
are as follows. First, those producing food, whether it be plant-based or animal-based, need to earn more when they change the way they operate and they adapt, adopt more sustainable ways of producing that food. Secondly, we really need to stop wasting a third of the food that we're producing. Nowhere is it acceptable to see 30% waste. And thirdly, we need to stop eating ourselves ill. Many of us fall in two categories. Either we overeat calories with very little nutrition in them, or we simply don't have access to enough food and we suffer from hunger or undernutrition. Now, in the case of global warming and climate change, it took 20 to 30 years for the debate to gain traction. In the case of the food systems, we just don't have that time because the threat is here right now, today. So let's be courageous. Let's take bold actions. Let's work together and let's get moving. Geraldine Matchett there. Agnes, you've heard from all of our speakers today. Do you want to weigh in with any remarks and something that may have jumped out to you? Thank you. Um, let me just say that uh, a lot of um, what would be considered bold action is already out there. Like I said at the beginning, we already have a lot to build on. Many of you have said a lot of things that need to be done. What we need to do is look at partnerships that we can build to be able to deliver together. Look at frameworks that will help us deliver as businesses, but also as governments, as communities. What type of frameworks can help us reach as many people as we can? And let me give you an example here. Each of the businesses we are talking to could decide to end waste by 100% in the next 10 years. That will still be 20% of the waste we need to end. We, we need everybody to engage, every community, every individual, every big business, every small business. So scale is about building frameworks that can be able to reach all of us. Another example, if you look at what the, the EU, for example, is doing with a strategic engagement around farm to fork strategy that looks at, let's say, just hypothetically speaking, as an example, cutting the amount of salt in food. If this framework is adopted as a strategic framework for that region, it will reach millions so it's extremely important to come up with frameworks that can help anchor some of the actions that we take so that all of us can act together. There's not going to be anything enough, anywhere enough coming from one of us, coming from a few of us. It has to be all of us engaging together. So I just want to, I wanted to, to, to bring that out and say that many of the actions are already known. Most of what we need to do is already known. We just need to act together. Agnes, thank you. We might try a quick round of responses now for everyone on some of the bold actions. And as we have this conversation, the pandemic has shaped a lot of the discussion that we're having, the acceleration in some of these trends, and that's in ag tech as well, the supply chain disruptions that we alluded to. Dominic, can you come in here as we try and get from A to B and reach these targets? Is there some momentum that you've seen in the last couple of months that can make a difference with the nine harvests that you mentioned before getting to 2030? And what do you think uh, is required when we talk about bold actions? actions from here. Yeah, thanks, Karen. I think there is momentum. I think um, the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic has done two things. First of all, it's revealed just the scale of the inclusion agenda, as well as the environmental agenda, that we really do need these collaborative partnerships. And second, that reliance um, only on official development assistance, aid in, in old terms, is, is going to be tough. Uh, the fiscal headroom in many countries is tightening, uh, global national income is falling. So these innovations are gonna to have to come from all sources as we've heard. A couple of examples, um, we, we've heard from, from, from India um, and the need for um, uh, improved technologies, um, particularly for smaller farmers. Um, some of the work that our colleagues at uh, Unilever and other companies are involved with have helped with drip irrigation in Connecticut um, through a, a collaboration involving the World Bank uh, uh, extensive water resources and agriculture, public and private, civil society, small farmers working together to get to that first mile of funding that uh, Kate was mentioning and deliver at scale. 
The challenge is that these things are not the usual ways of working, and it requires everyone, as you've heard um, from this panel, to actually almost put down a preconception and come together. We've got great leadership on this panel, and I think it's a call to arms for across that food system summit that there are great solutions out there um, from large and small players, from innovators, from different forms of finance, but to structure them and to deliver them is the hard work, and there are ways and means of doing it. That's what we need to focus on. Thank you, Karen. Kate, do you want to jump in here on some of the bold actions? Yes, I, can, I, can I come in, Karen? This is yes, come in. Oh, yes, Esther, come in you. first, yes. Uh, thank you. So I think what are the op uh, bold opportunities for, for action? First is that, yeah, there is a growing recognition now that agriculture must have multiple wins, not only increase productivity and income, but also increase soil health, increase biodiversity, increase health and nutrition, stronger adaptation while mitigating climate change. And from our experience, this is through agroecological, sustainable, biodiverse, integrated, diversified, natural, organic farming systems and approaches, integrating crops, livestock, fisheries, forestry, and trees. Second, the opportunity that COVID-19 pandemic brought is that local food systems became very important. And as what the other speakers said before, food was really basic for health and resistance to different virus viruses. But local food systems have been in major parts weakened by decades of neglect. So there is now a strong emerging uh, emerging. Uh, opportunity and call to help in the strengthening of the local food systems such as family farmers have cooling or storage or processing facilities they have they, they have logistic support to bring farmers products to the market like farm to market roads for example and capital not to maximize the opportunities in marketing that covid brings third is that you know, there is the declaration, UN declaration of the UN decade of family farming 2019 to 2028. And the a global action plan has been formulated already. And the opportunity right now for the governments, especially to lead in a multi-stakeholder process to translate this global action plan into national action plans. Because the UN decade of family farming, its, its plans, are aligned with at least 12 of the SDG goals, thus implementing the family farming decade through a multi-stakeholder approach with family farmers at the heart and at the center of the action will be an accelerator for the achievement of the SDGs. Yes, so just very quickly, as you talk about collaboration there, one of the other big factors has been technology. And I know that you've connected farmers up to virtual call centres to sell their crops during a coronavirus. Do you think some of the lessons during the pandemic could stick some of the technology that's been used? Yes, actually, it, uh, when the COVID happened, so many, many of the farmers uh, really adapted to, to doing things online, like online delivery of, of uh, products like organic rice, of the farmers in Indonesia to the consumers in, in the city. Or what you have mentioned before, the virtual call centers that, that, that were done by the, some, the, a group of Bangladesh farmers where they did collective buying of their of inputs and collective selling of their products through these virtual centers. And these virtual centers could aid the farmers, could give proper information for the farmers on, for example, where to sell the product, what is the price of, the, of their product in this and this uh, location. There have been several uh, technologies, that di the digital technologies that have been very useful during COVID is really online, uh, online business transactions, online knowledge of where is the demand, what is the demand, and where is the market. Right. Alan, I want to come over to you because you've seen a number of big themes, the hoarding of staples by many consumers during the pandemic. That's one thing, but also this consumer awakening around the impact on the environment from food consumption. So you've seen the, the rise in vegan trends. I know that Unilever has a new annual sales target of 1 billion euros from plant-based meat and dairy alternatives within the next five to seven years. How can bold targets like this help and where do you see the challenge for corporates? Karen, the uh, challenge that we're talking about here is so complicated, it can sometimes seem overwhelming. Um, so let me try and share just two frameworks that uh, might be helpful as we try and find our equivalent 
of one and a half degrees, but for the food system, we need to feed, um, in the next 40 years, we will need to produce more food than in the last 8,000 years. It's a hugely complex challenge. And may I humbly suggest two mindset shifts that could help. The first is on food consumption, if we can move towards affordable, nutritious, and more plant-based diets that support human and planetary health, that alone will make an enormous impact, shifting consumption towards plant-based. And then on the other side, on the supply side, to reinvent food production to support rural livelihoods and drive regenerative agriculture. So if we could move the whole food system towards more plant-based and more regenerative, those would be keystones in a structural shift in the food system that I think are understandable, simple, and most, um, most sectors could get behind. Alan, can you also weigh in on the, the collaboration required at a government level? We've seen a change in the White House, Joe Biden uh, elected. Do you think that's going to make a difference, having the US government supporting some of these initiatives? Ah, nice try dragging me into politics, Karen. Um, the transition that we're talking about is going to be disruptive. There are going to be winners. There are going to be losers. And so it's going to require policy intervention. And all these issues of climate change, inequality, the food system, they're all interconnected. And the more governments around the world that have got a long-term view around things like climate change, tackling inequality, prepared to make the hard choices on the food system, the better it will be for all of us. And it looks like the new administration in the US does have more appetite, pardon the pun, to tackle these big structural issues. I'm glad you used a pun. I was going to use one earlier too, Alan. Uh, Massimo, over to you. You just inspired us early on with some of your, your philosophy about dealing with food waste. How do you think others can take up the challenge? And can this be rolled out on a large scale as we talk about corporations and individuals, even in the home? Massimo, I think you're still on mute. Uh, home, you know, is a place where, you know, we waste the most. I was listening to Alan before and I, I, I don't agree 100% on uh, we have to produce more, but uh, I think we have to produce differently. Um, you know, with my project, uh, you know, Food for Soul, we were in Brazil and um, the approach uh, on, uh, on uh, food waste was incredible. You know, every day, just in Rio de Janeiro, we waste uh, um, 20, uh, 11 uh, big tracks full of fruit and vegetable, and vegetable, and they burn it because it's more expensive to distribute to the 2.5 million people they don't have anything to eat than uh, to burn it. And they don't care about climate change. So the point is, in Brazil, they waste 55% of the product that they produce. So it's like, I think it's, this is a, a challenge, a challenge for all of us to distribute the food better. You know, I've been asking myself a question recently. What is the purpose of a restaurant in the 21st century? It's a place to have a meal or a place to learn and discover, a place where culture is uh, proceed and share. I always thought of my restaurant as a laboratory of ideas, a place where we promote culture, where uh, we connect uh, to agriculture and tourism, a place for education, learning and growth. Uh, these connections are important uh, uh, to us. They keep us from isolating ourselves uh, into, in the kitchen. They keep us connecting to the communities and the world. Uh, they remind us that a restaurant does not exist uh, uh, to serve a meal, just to serve meals. We are at the beginning of a culinary revolution, a humanistic revolution, one that is leading chefs to step out of the kitchen and to connect with communities and issue outside of the world of hospitality. Can chef can make a difference by what they choose to serve at their table, on how they talk about ingredients and ideas, and more important, what are they teaching, you know, their team, bold action. 
Changing behavior begin with education, better food education for the better food future. It begins with our children, teaching them to know food, appreciate it, value it, as my grandmother was doing with me. Don't leave the table if you don't finish your plate. As uh, like our community does with the, in every single elementary school here in Modena, you know, in Emilia Romagna, that is called the Food Valley. You know, but it doesn't end there. Reeducates adults about how to shop, cook and eat. Remind the public to use their voice through what they choose to, to buy. Can we encourage food system that favors sustainable resources, artisan production, um, relationship, respect for product and for the people who make them? The act of cooking is an ethical act. Let's start asking where our food comes from and how we can secure its future. If every step of the chain has been carried out in an ethical structure, the final result will be better and more delicious. Okay. And there's a role to take in the field, in our kitchen, at home, in business, and at school. It's important to be resourceful with ingredients, not to be wasteful. So to have respect for the food that we prepare, but also to the food that we eat daily. Be inquisitive. We must make the, the you know, we, these ethical choices part of our everyday life. When we change this mindset, we can get the most out of the energy and resources that right. go into producing our food system. We right. can invite innovation and process that are not only ethical, but healthy and equitable for people and the planet. To right. see real measurable change quickly, we must remember to also simplify things for people, help them to take small steps that uh, they commit to. That's right. why I always say that Food for Soul is a cultural project and not a charity project. You know? Massimo. Mm. Yeah. Yes, Culture. important messaging there about wastage and mindset. I said to my daughter in the crisis, don't waste food. We can't just go to the shop and get more. So I think the pandemic has changed that messaging. Kate, I want to get to you because uh, you've seen many breakthroughs from young people anything that you think can, can stick on a larger scale? We do, provided we can get the funding to them and the funding that we gather up for them ourselves at our organization, we pass straight through. We're not taking that money for the organization. The one thing that I would say is, yes to everybody's been saying the collaboration word. This is this is the one that really challenges everybody. We have 12,000 young leaders in 196 countries who want to collaborate. We work with Unilever, we work with DSM, we work with the World Economic Forum, we work with several of the organizations on here. I think the one thing we lacked in this group to collaborate, and a couple of you have said it, was government. We need government in here. One Young World works with some governments, but not enough. But what young leaders are looking for from groups like ours is not to be patronized. I mean, this group on this call, not to be patronized. They want to move at scale and speed. That is the thing we can collaborate on, moving at scale and speed. Sunny, let me toss it over to you because you mentioned before about the resilience of some farmers, very low incomes that they have. And one of the ideas that Olam has highlighted in the past has been for crop and income diversification. Do you want to weigh on this and any other bold action you think is required from here? Uh, as I mentioned, the first thing that we need to solve for is how do we improve living incomes? And in order to live, uh, improve living incomes, we need to find ways of getting the farmers to be able to produce more with less and also produce uh, more sustainable produce for which we should pay them. So just uh, in 2019, Olam, just for one of its crops that we supply to our customers, which is cocoa, both cocoa beans, as well as uh, cocoa ingredients like cocoa butter powder, like a cake, we paid farmers who were growing that for us and who were supplying that to us $138 million of sustainability premiums because our customers were interested in climate positive cocoa, deforestation free cocoa, child labor free cocoa. And that is an example of how uh, we could be doing right by the producers and the farmers. We could be doing right by the planet if we have this ability to get granular traceability 
and encourage farmers to produce more with less. So that is one point. I think uh, Alan made a very important point that this is a very complex terrain in terms of what we're trying to achieve. So I think the yearning for trying to get to something like one and a half or two degrees centigrade, a big, bold uh, aspiration that we could all uh, focus on is becoming a little bit more challenging. But at the same time, as business leaders, we know if there is no focus, it's very difficult to execute and the action gap continues to widen. So in my view, we should probably in phase one focus on four or five really important things that we can make a pivot to a more sustainable food system. So one is farmer incomes, as we discussed. Second is uh, climate and nature positive agriculture, including regenerative agriculture. And that includes deforestation free production as well. The third is we focus on child labor because two thirds of the world's child labor, 260 million child labor in the world, two thirds are in agriculture. So how do we address the underlying root causes for making sure that we can dramatically reduce child labor? So that would be the third objective that I think we should focus on. The fourth is really sustainability labeling uh, as is uh, envisaged in the European Green Deal, whether it's front of the pack, back of the pack, a harmonized code of sustainability labeling, I think will yank the entire value chain forward to um, uh, doing things sustainably because there is going to be an economic payoff by doing things sustainably. And finally, I think government and policymakers have to come to the party to make sure the carbon tax is applied, to make sure that there's mandatory disclosure of all our footprints, to make sure that we're reporting on how we're reducing resource intensity for every ton of food, feed, and fiber that we produce. I think if you focus on these five things, initially in phase one, we would address 60, 70% of the problems of transforming agriculture. And we have to take a comfort from what Dominic said, that there are, there are innovative transformative solutions which have been tested at scale. We need to come together to amplify the impact of this. We don't really need to find the next big uh, breakthrough that doesn't exist. All of these ideas have been tested at scale by different players. Right. We just need to come together to amplify that. Sonny, just quickly, do you have a message to President-elect Biden about what he can do to weigh in? I think he's already committed $5 trillion to become more sustainable and fight climate action. The European Union has committed a, a trillion euro for this purpose. Uh, and I think that's a fantastic start. Sunny, thank you very much. And to all of our speakers, Agnes, do you want to come in? You've heard so much from our speakers on various commitments and bold actions. What do you think? Well, thank you. And it's great to listen to all this and the commitment that I'm hearing. I mean, the engagement that I'm hearing from everybody. I would say the, the most important probably the first bold action is already happening, that we are coming together with the determination and the commitment to see things change. So for me, <clears throat> excuse me, for me, this is huge. And the next message is, as, as someone was asking, I think this Sunny, governments are also coming on the table. There are a number of governments that are engaged. There are a number of governments that want to engage. And in fact, the question I'm, I'm, I'm being asked is, where is private sector? Is the private sector going to engage enough? So governments are definitely going to be in and they want to, uh, we already have um, government uh, country level national dialogues going on and those dialogues will, will say a lot around what governments can do. I think the last point I wanted to make is, um, someone mentioned uh, the, the point around, um, you know, win-lose. When you look at what's happening within our food system, yes, there are lots of choices to make, Yes, there are going to be a few things we have to drop. And yes, there are going to have to be a few things we have to pick up as we go. But the transition of our food system is going to have to be a win for each of us. If there is one message I want to leave with you, it's just that. It's going to be a win for, for each of us. And what we need to do is to really work hard together to understand how we bring each of us along so that it's not a lose for anybody. So thank you again, and thank you for the contributions that you put on the table. Agnes, thank you, and let me also express my thank you to our speakers today for your time and for the fantastic comments that you've made. Dominic, Esther, Alan, Massimo, Kate, Sunny, thank you very much for your time. Now we're going to wrap up this conversation, but I'm going to toss it over to introduce you to Her Excellency, Miss Carola Shelton, who will have some remarks on video for us. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to welcome you to this conference on bold actions. 
and let me share with you my boldest message. We urgently need to build back better and greener to safeguard food security. As we all know, climates, food production, ecosystems and economies across the globe depend on each other. And people depend on them. Weaknesses are now being exposed, resulting in extra scarcities of nutritious food and more people suffering from hunger. The corona pandemic reveals the vulnerabilities of food systems even more. And sadly, it's the poorest populations that are hit the hardest. We must join forces worldwide. My country accepts its responsibility and is equipped to fulfill it. With people like you who are eager to pull expertise and work with academics and entrepreneurs in many different ways. Be it on climate adaption, smart logistics, circular cultivation methods or sustainable business models. Coordinating national policy efforts is crucial and I will emphasize this again at the UN Food Systems Summit next year and advocate a leading role in this for the Netherlands. And we is key. It includes you, me, our host, Wageningen University, the European Commission, the FAO, the World Bank and the OECD with their ambitious agendas. And the unnamed farmers, fishers and consumers who won't be taking part in the conference. And let's work on a future in which people can have nutritious food, in which nature benefits more and in which our children can live healthy lives. Let's seek out new partnerships today and act wisely. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Minister. Um, and a big thank you to everyone who participated in today's opening session. It's clear from what we've heard that there are so many bright uh, spots of innovation and solutions to create better food systems. So to our audience, we invite you to continue joining Bold Actions for Food as a force for good throughout today and tomorrow. And to the people out there watching today, uh, those of you who are watching, every one of us is a citizen. Every one of us is a consumer. And every time we eat, we are making conscious choice about the state of the world we want to live in. Choices that affect the planet, they affect the state of our own health and our own well-being, and the livelihoods of the people and farmers throughout the food system. We cannot stress how important that is. Over the last year, we hope you've learned something to make these choices easier. And we invite you to be more conscious in your choices going forward. Um, finally, individuals from all over the world are invited to continue to take part in preparations for the summit through Food System Summit Dialogues, targeted to reach every country around the world and in the coming year, and to join myself and Idris as we continue to campaign with Global Citizen and EFAD to call on world leaders to invest in our food systems and the most vulnerable farmers and people who are on the front lines of climate change. So you are invited to join. I'm delighted to now open the rest of the day's proceedings and thank you so much everyone.